Hello, hello everyone. Um, my name is Kathy McPhillips. I head up marketing for the Content Marketing Institute. And this is our sixth weekly Thursday conversations. And what we're doing each week is we are going through a track from Content Marketing World. We're all watching the sessions and then we're just getting a chance to speak with some of the speakers, ask a few more questions I, I had, you know, personally watching their sessions, opening up, opening it up to all of you to ask them the questions. So this week we are talking SEO. So we have Katie Tweedy from Collective Measures. We have Brian Piper from the University of Rochester. And we have Mike Murray from um, Online Marketing Coach. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited. Thanks for having us. Uh, I, loved your I loved your sessions. I am not an ex SEO pro, but I got so much useful information out of your sessions. I'm ready to go back to our web team and be like, okay, guys, I have some great ideas. <laughs> so, so thank you. So we're missing Christoph Tripp. He had a big meeting today. He couldn't join us. So if you haven't watched the sessions, make sure you do because they were really, really helpful. Very, very tactical. Very, very, I, I have lists that I'm ready to just rock and roll um, and get through some things. So, and Mike, I'm probably going to be calling you to help us with this stuff because, you know, you're a great partner to CMI. So I'm just going to jump in with some questions. And uh, like I said, like I told you backstage, if you have answers to someone else's question when they're finished talking, just jump in. This is super casual. We'll be on 20, 30 minutes. And um, if anyone's watching and has questions, please, please leave us a note and I'll make sure to ask your question um, when we get a moment. So Katie, I'm starting with you. Oh boy. So featured snippets, you know, yeah. I see them, I, you know, they pop up. Actually the other day on Monday, I was talking to Monina from our team and Amanda, we were on a call and we were talking about a grammar question. So I uh, jumped in and I, or I Googled something while we were talking and Mo said, was it Grammarly? Was it, you know, with, and I'm like, I don't know, it was Google. So I was usually using that featured snippet. It took me a second to figure out where it was from, but it was right there and they gave me my answer. So that was my no click search that I did. So how do you, tell us like how you start with that and how do you track, I guess my biggest question is, I know what they are, but how do you track what featured snippets that you have, that you own? Right. That's a really great question. And right now, um, unfortunately, you're likely going to have to use a tool to do that tracking for you. Uh, what we have is the free tools that you have at your disposal, you know, your um, analytics, your search consoles, your you know, ring consoles, et cetera, can show you what keywords you're ranking for. And you can filter that down to your position. But position one doesn't necessarily mean featured snippet, you know, to get to what featured snippets you're actually ranking for and you own right now, you're going to have to use another tool. A tool that we use is SEMrush. It does a really lovely job of breaking out the featured snippet you own and what kind of featured snippet it is. And that way you can kind of get a list of, all right, what do I own in this moment in time? And then you can kind of start tracking those. Uh, you could do manual searches for those, but because search is so personalized, that isn't always even the best way to find that information of what featured snippets you're owning and you're ranking for. And it's incredibly manual and would take a really long time. So I highly recommend using a tool. And again, SEMrush is one that we use that I think is really successful in telling you based on your domain, what are the featured snippets you're owning in this snapshot in time? And that gives you a starting point for you to start measuring against. So when you are you know, working on your SEO and you're trying to rank, are you trying to rank for the snippet? Or are you trying to rank for number one? Is that, or is that one and the same? I, so when you're creating content and fellas, I'm sure that you will agree and feel free to jump in here. Obviously you're trying to bait for your number one ranking spot, right? Like the higher you rank, obviously the more traffic you get, the more visibility you get, all the good stuff. Ranking for featured snippet, even more visibility. You kind of get that like authority, if you will, for owning that featured snippet. So there are things that you can do when you're creating and um, structuring your content to bait those featured snippets. But to answer your question, when I'm creating content, I'm thinking, how can I best answer the user's question? How can I best address this topic? How can I make sure I'm addressing all of those like micro topics or subtopics underneath it to make sure I've got the most well-rounded best answer possible to make the user happy? And that in turn should mean that you've got the best answer that helps you rank. And if you structured it in a beautiful, organized, clear way, hopefully you're also baiting those featured snippets. <laughs> Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, 
just featured snippets are only going to be part of the game. So I like what you were describing there, because if you get really good content and you've optimized it and you end up being number two, for example, you know, you're still going to get a large percentage of the traffic from a number two or three position. So, you know, make the right content. Hope you get the featured snippet since it's at the top, but um, just settle for doing a good job and, and getting the best ranking you can. I mean, we're always telling people write for your audience, not for, for Google. But if you can drop in some things and, you know, keep your rankings up, then obviously that's the best of both worlds. Right. Um, which actually brings me to a question to you, Mike. You know, you talked a lot about keyword locations. I know that's something you help us with at CMI, that we're making sure that um, we have all these keywords in the right places and titles and things like that. And there are so many places you can do that. How does that impact? Like, what's the, where do you start? You know, some people aren't doing this and you give us a pretty you know, long list of places. So how would you suggest tackling that? Um, I'll, two, two things come to mind. One, one is the SEO page title. I call that Mike Murray's Playground. So I get to do whatever I want there and no one ever sees it till you actually rank. So that's, that's more near the metadata. That's not the header on the page. And the, getting the keywords up at the beginning of those, that's really important. So a lot of times people want to write a, 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 a ranking result, a title tag that actually has a lot of pizzazz to it and it's real clever and they have a lot of extra marketing language. But the more words you put in that SEO page title, the more it weights everything down. So your, your odds of ranking are gonna be less. So one of the things I do is I start off an SEO page title, usually with a question mark or with a colon. So I'll just introduce a phrase, stop right there with a colon and then add some more information after that. But that's a little device I use, just posing a question to, to get that keyword up there as soon as I can or, or using a colon. And then if you do headers, you really want to bake in that keyword phrase. I know that Google looks at more than just phrases, but I found it's difficult to rank for a phrase if that phrase isn't even on the page. So getting keywords as close to the beginning of a header or as close to the beginning of an SEO title tag, that's important. And actually, Brian, you touched on this a lot in your presentation too. Do you have anything to add? Uh, well, very similar to what Mike says, a lot of the time the writers will want to come up with a very clever, clickbaity, catchy title. So I'll let a lot of our news stories go out with that title. I make sure that the URL is already keyword optimized since most people don't look at that. So I'll let the title, the, the catchy, clever title be used within uh, for all the promotions within the newsletters and within social, and it brings a lot of traffic. But after a month or so, I'll go back and change that title and remove the clever, catchy title and really get those keywords focused in there because at that point, then you already know what the page is already ranking for. So it's easier to optimize for those keywords. That was really interesting. I liked how you said, you know, go in and make sure that your URL is, is you know, it has all the keywords and then going back and change. Like, I don't know. I don't know if we do that. And I'm not Mike, the person that would be doing this. I'm not even sure if we do. Mike, maybe you know that. No, no. We, we look at the data and go back at strategic ones. I, I look at things that are like striking distance. So when we go back and look at data, if something's ranking 18 or 20 or 22, it's something we can move up a little easier. Then we'll go back and, and adjust that page. But uh, the main thing is to see how it performs on its own. Sometimes those clever SEO titles work just fine. So you want to see how that particular page played out. I have a question for anybody who's tuning in to what, what we're talking about here. So I want to know how many characters you can put in an SEO title. Obviously, I know the answer to that, but a lot of people say you can do 50 characters, 60. Well, it depends on what Google says today. Maybe it's 63. And they all make those decisions based on the design of the SERPs, the, the search engine result pages. But Google never actually says how many characters you can have. What Google likes to do is add an ellipse and skip keywords and not show keywords and marketers hate that. It's like, those are my precious words. I have to have those <laughs> up in the, they have to be visible. So I'm just gonna do 50 characters or 60. The point is Google doesn't have a limit. They don't specify that it has to be 72 or 78. So one of the things I've done over time is experiment with it. There are actually words I put in SEO page titles that aren't visible because they get truncated. There's the, the evil ellipse that appears. But that word, the presence of that word in the SEO title actually helps resonate with the rest of the content and helps that page rank. So the word doesn't have to be visible in the final blue link in order to be effective. So I've, this is for all of you. Um, you. You obviously are very talented in what you're doing. You're, you're experts in for your companies. 
but there are a lot of people that are viewing and watching and attending content marketing world who this is just a small portion of their job. So what are some places to start? Do you have blog posts we can throw in this um, on the Facebook page after we're done? Or do you have a checklist or what would be a place for someone to start? Okay, well, I've run, run a lot of I've run a lot of workshops across uh, the university and for other universities where we'll go in and we'll just kind of do a high level SEO audit. So just to look and see, and, and you can use, um, you know, any of these tools, SEM rush, Ahrefs, usually they'll have a, uh, a free account that you can sign up for. Even Moz will let you do it. So then you can just run a report to see what pages you're already ranking for. And then, if those are aligned with your strategic initiatives, it's really easy to go back and say, these are the pages that we need to optimize first because they're driving the most traffic, they're already ranking, it's kind of low hanging fruit. And that's where we usually start when we're, we're working on an SEO project with a new client. You can read a lot of articles, um, any article out there, but it's just, that's knowledge. You really have to have the practicum. So I like the idea of the audit because then it becomes your data that you're gonna maybe relate to. So people have to do something and take some steps. The biggest mistake I see marketers making with SEO is they just pick out keywords. Like I like that keyword, I like that key. That's a great one too. I'd love to have that keyword but they don't look at um, really how competitive that keyword phrase might be. So maybe they see one that has a thousand searches a month. It's like, I'd love to have that keyword phrase. But if if you're not ranking in the top 10 for something that has 50 searches a month or hundred searches a month, you know how can you go after the, the 1000? So I try to get people to look at lots of variables, the competition, the, the nature of the word, the intent of the searcher behind it, how you're already ranking already for some other words. So look at a complete set of data in order to make some decisions. You can't just start looking at words. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to add to this is the idea that SEO is not, it, it hopefully shouldn't be an onerous task. I know that a lot of people who are doing SEO is like a, a part of your other job. It can find it to be kind of like an extra step that you don't want to have to take. But if you look at it this way, which is the way I like to look at SEO, is you're already doing all of the hard work to create this content for your audience. SEO is just another layer to make sure that the hard work you're doing has the best chance to be seen in search, right? So if you're thinking about it, that lens, hopefully that, that perspective means it's not like another chore, it's just a way to make sure the work you're already doing has the best chance for success. In uh, when you're thinking about how do I measure it, just it start small. Start thinking about your your copy or you know your page on your website and saying, all right, I know that we talk about it internally this way. Maybe I should just do a quick Google search with that keyword to see if I see any other topics around that term. Is that internal speak or is that the way that other people are talking about it too? So even you don't even have to use tools when you're getting started. You can just straight up do a Google search just to get a gut check if that term is you know, jargon or if it's the way your consumer is talking about it. And then just slowly start thinking about you know, using more concrete you know, SEO friendly keywords in your copy as opposed to like the fluffier fun words. Not to say that you can't use fun words, but I think that starting small and then mm -hmm measuring that success and starting to see how those optimizations help you improve is a really great way to sort of give yourself positive feedback that the work you're doing works. Right. And it makes sense. You know, we spend so much time creating this epic content and we want people to see it. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're doing our marketing, we're doing our uh, amplification, but SEO is such a key part of that. Exactly. So, yeah, and to Mike, to your point earlier, you know, I was talking to Monita actually just about an hour ago. We were talking about social media and how much time to invest in certain places. And there's one place that just doesn't right now, right now have a lot of followers. So why would we invest all this time doing that if we don't have an audience there who's, who's, who's ready to digest our content right. to see it? Yeah. So since we were talking about tools, I want to jump into this a little bit. I was writing notes as while I was watching your session. I'm like, Mike, at three and a half minutes, you go through all these tools. At Brian, at <laughs> one minute, you go through all these tools. So let's talk about tools for a minute. So first of all, I love Yoast. I think, I know, I think Brian, you talked about Yoast. But um, what's something, I'll ask two questions. One, what's something is a good starting point? I know SEMrush is a great starting point. We, you all talked about that already. Um, 
a starting point, a good free one, just to kind of get your feet wet. And what's something that you think people should invest in? Everything can't, we can't do everything for free. Is that for Brian or who, who's that Anyone. for? Mike, go ahead, you could start. And then we'll just uh, go around. Um, I recommend Keyword Cheater. Uh, keyword cheater? Yeah, Keyword Cheater. It's uh, S-H-E-E-P-E-R. It's a fascinating spelling of Keyword Cheater. Um, so it's something a lot of people probably haven't come across, but it gives you a lot of different combinations once you put some keywords in there. So it, it gives it, there are some pay tools involved in there, but it's a nice place to start for some free combinations. So um, it'll help you sort things out between negative versions of the keyword and, and, and other, other variations. So it's a funny name, Keyword Cheater. And I think it's just .com, Keyword Cheater, S-H-E-E-T-E-R. Um, that's one. Another one's uh, KW Finder. That's uh, really easy to find some non, you know, low competitive keyword phrases. So they're both tools. Um, they're a little bit overlapping with some other tools that are out there, but they're real intuitive and easy to use. So I'd recommend those two um, in, terms, in terms of the free ones. So if you have not watched their sessions yet, you really should because there's so much information on you know how you can just help yourself very easily. You know, just doing a little bit more than what you're already doing. So Katie, you're nodding. So I'm just going to turn to you. Do you have any tools that you love? <laughs> yeah, um, I just for like the keyword research aspect of the work, I really like for free tools. Uh, answer the public. They are, it's just a great way you put in your, your root keyword and it spits out a whole bunch of related keywords based on questions. So you don't get search volume attached to it, but if you're just thinking um, like ideation, especially if it's a brand new topic for your um, content creation, it's a great place to start just to kind of get the ball rolling and help you think of new ideas or those like subtopics that you need to make sure you're addressing when you're adequately talking about the topic on the page. Um, and this is, not quite the same as a different tool, but I am a real Search Console evangelist. I love Search Console. I think there's a lot of really great information you can get out of that. And it's free for you. So I highly recommend using that. <laughs> I, I have another tool here. Maybe we can chime in again. Um, Screaming Frog, a lot of people have heard about because it's more, it has a like a technical aura to it. But one of the things I do to cheat or to save a little bit of time with Screaming Frog is I'm, I'm riveted onto the uh, page title data that comes out of that. So when I look at competitors or I look at my client's website, it scours every single page on their website. And just like that, fat, it try to compete with SEM Rush for how fast it works. But just like that, it'll tell me all the page titles for all the pages on, on the competitor's website. And sometimes they don't do a great job you know, with their page titles, but sometimes they have beginnings of one so maybe half the page title and so that the, the keywords start to bounce off of there yeah i mean i actually have to export them they don't really bounce off but the um, screaming frog reports is an easy way to channel into those page titles where someone's provided some descriptive copy about what their page is about so that's one of the first places i go all the time if i use SEM rush and i look at a competitor i have to sort by keyword because sometimes there's too many keywords so it's better to alphabetize and then you can get rid of a lot of product names and uh, brand names and, and other wacky words in there. So if you're looking for keyword ideas from a tool like SDMrush, definitely use the alpha, alpha, alphabetizing technique. Nice. So Brian, you know, you have a you know, different perspective being in education. Um, one, are there any tools specific to education or any other tool you want to just toss out there? And then how is SEO different for higher ed than it is for you just your average or any other industry? Um, well, start off with the tools. So free tools. We were talking about, uh, like Katie was talking about, the importance of keyword research. So one of the conversations that I always have with our content creators is, you know, you spend all this time writing this great content, and then you put it out on the web, and 300 people go visit it. You know, isn't it worth like an extra 15 minutes of keyword research if you could then put it out and 10,000 people come and read it? So I've got all of them, all of our content creators are using Ubersuggest, which is a great free tool where you can go in and it's very easy to use. You can type in your keyword and it gives you all sorts of related phrases. It gives you the keyword difficulty. It gives you the uh, search volume for those different phrases. So it's a very easy, accessible tool for uh, someone who doesn't do a lot of SEO to just go in and use to do some really quick kind of high level research. Um, two free tools that I like to use 
that are incorporated right into your browser are Keyword Surfer, so it's a Chrome plugin. So whenever you're searching something in Google, it gives you the search volumes for all the different results that you're getting. So you can look and see exactly how many people are searching for that uh, and how many other sites are already competing against you for that. Um, and then Mozbar is also a great one because then you can see the domain authority for the other uh, competitive sites that you're trying to you know, compete against for that ranking. Um, you know, being in higher ed, uh, we put out a lot of content. We have several different groups across the institution who are all putting out their own content, uh, all within our domain. So that's great for building our domain authority. Our domain authority is higher because we've been around for a long time. So a lot of that makes SEO easier for uh, us to do in a lot of ways, but then we're also competing against other institutions who have also been around for a long time and have high domain authority. So it's a, a bit of a, um, a different uh, comp competition realm, but you know we have a lot of content that we can really optimize for. That's really great. One thing I love that you mentioned was annotation in Google Analytics, because you always think you'll remember when you did something, you're like, oh, and, and you won't. I won't, you know, so that was a really, really good suggestion. Um, so talking about Google Analytics, and you know, Mike, I had a question for you. So and this is me being completely 100% ignorant. Um, so you talked a lot about experimenting and, you know, trying different things. Does Google ding you for that? Like, I know there's there is some longevity with your site and building up that authority. But if you're changing things here and there, does Google penalize you for that? Um, you can't really go too wrong on the page itself. Um, Google doesn't seem to like it when you change like a page URL and say, you know what, I'm gonna try that keyword in the URL and I'll introduce a new keyword and I'll have a brand new URL and I'll redirect the other one to the new URL. You really shouldn't do that. Those URLs gain history and authority in their own right over time. So unless you got a swear word in the URL, you should probably keep what you have out there and try to make do with it. Cause it's a small part of of how you're going to rank in the first place. So don't change page URLs, but I've had a lot of success with my clients going back and trying four different variations of that SEO page title, tinkering with the the uh, keyword in the header, even the work that, that I've done with CMI, we have the main graphic that it highlights the headline of, of the article, and then that won't match the header anymore. So we get together and we kind of do some nuances. There's an article out there that we did on FAQs and how they're successful, like a treasure trove for, for SEO. The header doesn't match the graphic anymore. The title tag, the SEO title doesn't match the header. There's no consistency. But we've tried that three or four different times and the rankings continue to elevate over time. So Google doesn't penalize you for basic changes to the website or introducing a new image or changing the alt text. Um, but the main thing to do is just protect those page URLs because people like get a little too quick to change those. And no one notices them except for marketers, right? Right. I mean, I do. I notice it, but I think that's just because I also proof things when I read them. So we, we marketers do strange things. Um, so, you know, the, one of the best practices for SEO certainly is making sure that your content is relevant. And then that's probably the starting point before you know any of this. So do you have any good advice for making sure your content's relevant, doing audits, putting systems in place, and for or even for content refreshes? Who, who's going to chime in on that one? I'm going to ask, I'm putting Brian on the spot, just because you said you have so much content out there. Uh, yeah, so what we try to do is we do, uh, we'll archive content. So we'll look at performing content over time. If we have a piece of content that's been particularly flat, that doesn't have any um, relevance to our strategic initiatives, then we'll archive that content because, you know, there are some studies out there that show that the fewer pages you have, the easier it is for Google to crawl that. And then, you know, consequently, they uh, will rank some of your content higher. So. We do uh, periodic you know, archiving of content. We remove articles that are no longer relevant and make sure that we aren't breaking any links to those articles that already exist. Awesome. Yeah. Mike, Katie, Katie, do you want to go jump in? Yeah, I'm just going to say, Brian, I love that. I think a lot of content marketers are terrified to delete old content or not, you know, delete entirely, as you're saying, making sure you're protecting the redirects and everything. But like, 
bit, sometimes content is our babies and it's hard to say goodbye, but I love, love, love that you've got a process in place for archiving content that isn't serving you or your audience anymore. I also think there's um, part of that is taking a look at as things are changing, going back and refreshing based on you know information that you have now that might change things. Uh, 2020 was a wild year. And a lot of things that were true in 2019 are no longer true in 2020. <laughs> um, so making sure you're refreshing your content so it's accurate still. And sometimes I think there's a really good place where you can take a look at your content and say, all right, over the course of the past year, we've done three or four pieces on the same general topic. Um, they're performing okay, but you know, they're just basically different takes of the same topic. What about uh, combining them into like one page that talks about this topic in a little bit more depth and seeing how that performs? I think that that can be another valuable way to kind of refresh, reuse the content you've already created. Hey, Kathy, I have a 30 second tip for everybody. Can I, can we squeeze in 30 more seconds today? Absolutely. All right, first 10 seconds. Everyone needs to go to our presentations because you're really gonna get the, the, the morsels that you need to do to improve SEO. So just check out the presentation. If you check out my presentation, you gotta go to the Betty Crocker section. All right, so I spent a lot of time hanging out with Betty Crocker and, and I was trying to hang out in the kitchen, but I ended up on the website anyway. So on the website, I found a bunch of data about pancakes. And when I was on the pancake section, I found out they rank for lots of pancake related words, but they're really stuck on saying classic pancakes. Because After all, I guess there are classic pancakes. So what I discovered was if they actually use the word recipe, like Google knows they're about recipes, they just intuitively know that. But if they actually add the word recipe to their content, which wasn't on there, then they could probably uh, spawn all sorts of keyword rankings from that. So in the presentation, I actually did some design work for them, just free for, for that presentation. I don't work with Betty Crocker. And I added the word our recipe to the top of the page. It seemed like it would fit in really well with the design. At every page, there's thousands of pages about recipes. And I was advocating in there. And other people could do the same thing with their own content. Find little gems like that. Where can you enhance your content and without overstuffing it? So saying our recipe on a page about recipes at the very top, you know, high on the page in text and not a graphic, that was my recommendation. So I hope, you know, to meet the folks at Betty Crocker someday and they can figure out the impact of that. But I saw the opportunity on many, many pages if they just changed something in the design, two simple words. So I'm envisioning this, Mike, I feel like you're going to be the next Mr. Davis of SEO. You can do like unsolicited advice columns where you just tell people. You could be doing it a lot better, and I, I can help you do it. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'm, I told you I keep you 20 or 20 or 30 minutes, and we're rounding 30. So um, I'll start with Brian, and then Mike, then Katie. Let me know, let everyone know how they can reach you. Uh, I know Mo has been putting it in the in the chats, but um, and if you have anything else you want to share right now, the floor is yours. I am. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brian W. Piper, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Listen to the uh, presentations, great content from, from uh, everybody here. Use your Google Analytics, use Google Search Console, go in and, and use your data to figure out how you can improve your organic traffic. And SEO is lots of very easy things you can do to make really large uh, improvements in your traffic. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, no, that's fine. Just check me out at, at Mike Online Coach. Um, that's on Twitter, um, where you can go to my website, onlinemarketingcoach.com. But the presentations are far more, far more valuable. So take the time to get the information from there. Awesome. And hi again, I'm Katie Tweedy. I think the name's down there. You can find me on Twitter at, at Katie underscore Tweedy underscore. There are a lot of Katie's out there. I have to do some fun punctuation. Um, <laughs> Also on LinkedIn, and then um, I work at an agency, Collective Measures, in Minneapolis. But agreed, most of the like just the content that you can find in these different uh, web webinars are just amazing. This was a lot of fun, interesting tidbits to learn. Yes. Well, thank you all so much. This was really fun. I learned so much along the way that I'm excited to put into practice. So next Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern, we will be talking teams and culture. And I'll be here again. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here. And if you have any more questions, leave them in the chat or leave them in the Facebook group because I know all the speakers are in there and they're reading your questions as well. So thank you, and we'll see you next week.
Thank you very much. Bye.